Um, it's great to see so many of you here on a rainy, wet Tuesday so early in January before our semester has officially started. So thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of you are here to hear from Jeff Beckman, who is the author of a fantastic new book called The United States and Genocide, Redefining the Relationship. This is the book he's going to be talking a little bit about today in his talk, but also more broadly about state responsibility for genocide. Uh, Jeff is a professorial lecturer in human rights and is also the director of the Ethics, Peace and Global Affairs MA program at American University's School of International Service. Uh, this book was recently published. He just told me of a copy that he's also working on a second book project on cultural genocide over the next several months. Um, and I'm super excited that he is here to talk to us today about this really, really important topic. Before I pass over to Jeff, I just want to let you know about one more really fantastic event we're going to have tomorrow. Um, actually, also in this room, we're going to be hearing from Joseph Weiler, who is a professor at NYU, and he is going to be talking about the unveiling decision of the European Court of Justice on the wearing of the muslin veil in public, which was a European Court of Justice case uh, out of France that was decided um, in the mid-2017. Uh, about the legality of wearing muslin veils in public and on uh, banning the use of veils in public. So that's a really fantastic opportunity to hear from Profe sorry, Professor Joseph Weiler from NYU tomorrow. So if you're also interested in that, I hope to see you back in here at the same time then. So with that, I'll hand over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as Jeff said, I, I do teach uh, human rights at the American University School of National Service. Um, the majority of my research has been in the uh, field of genocide studies, um, but also other forms of political violence. And some of that will um, you know, come into to play today. I did want to, because of the, the law school location, want to um, emphasize some of the stuff around state responsibility uh, and relate to the International Court of Justice and its role um, and one of the things I'm, I'm especially interested in is not simply, uh, I guess, international criminal responsibility, which you know, gets at decision making at, at certain levels of government, but the fact that even when there is disagreement at the different institutional levels or among individual members of government or elected officials, uh, that states still hold responsibility for the actions um, that are carried out. Um, through the state mechanism. So uh, I'll come back to that in, as I move forward. Um, so let me give you a, sort of the objectives for the talk. Uh, I did want to note sort of the controversy in the field of genocide studies. And uh, I have a couple of slides that I'm going to show you. Uh, so I did have this book launch uh, at the School of National Service. is something they do for authors when they publish books. And I did get um, some pushback that, uh, unfortunately, was sort of ad hominem rather than on the substance of what I was arguing. At least that's my interpretation. And so I'll share that with you because I think it sort of frames the discussion in that you know, there is certainly some controversy, at least uh, among uh, certain parties, about the stuff that I wrote about. And I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I did want to then get into redefining genocide. So um, you know, the Genocide Convention, of course, has the legal definition. But due to uh, deficiencies in that definition, uh, scholars have been creating alternative definitions. Uh, then I'll get into the U.S. responsibility for genocide and then the issues of accountability. Uh, and then, of course, there will be time for questions after. So one of the emails I received uh, leading up to, so the book talk, of course, is supposed to be the celebratory event, right? Like, I just published this book, and, my, and the school that I teach at is celebrating that with, with an event. And the morning of the event, I received an email and it said, quote, I also cannot agree. So the first disagreement leading to the also was that whether we should be creating new definitions of genocide or whether we should only be using the legal definition. So first, the uh, individual that wrote this said he cannot agree with you know, alternative definitions, but also with my, quote, Chomsky and Marxist analysis of US foreign policy, Chomsky and Edward Herman Somewhere the person read into um, that I admire these people and therefore share any things that they have said in all cases, including denying the Khmer Rouge genocide in Cambodia, which is not the case at all. It's actually talked about, not at great length, but it's talked about in the book. And they never admitted they were wrong, even when challenged. You seem to agree also with their Blame America First School of Academic Marxism. 
Uh, I mean, maybe that is closer to my views. Um, I do, I am very critical of the United States policy, especially foreign policy, and we'll get to that as we move forward. The other major disagreement was, does everyone know who Samantha Power is? Okay. Uh, Samantha Power wrote the book that is probably the most read genocide studies book. It also won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. Um, and while my book was not meant to be a response to Samantha Power directly, uh, it definitely critiques her, and there's really no way, I think, to address U.S. foreign policy and its relationship with genocide without having to also address Samantha Power in some way. So he wrote, or I shouldn't say he, that helps identify the person in some way. Uh, the person wrote, quote, your critique of Samantha Power uh, because of her omission uh, of analysis of many gen genocides is utterly unfair. She never attempted to present a comprehensive study of every genocide of the 20th century. She chose several in which the U.S. failed, or as she believes, succeeded in providing humanitarian assistance as a substitute for forceful intervention to stop genocides. Her book would have been stronger if it also presented U.S. complicity in the Bangladesh, Guatemala, and other genocides, but the point of her book is to show readers what U.S. policy has been and what might be done to change it. So, uh, in my response, I you know, provided a very sort of measured response, and the point that I made is not that you know, she had to talk about every single case of genocide, it's just that the ones that she omits from her book are also the ones in which the U.S. had a close relationship with those that committed genocide, and, and I'll talk about that as we move forward as well. So I refer to this as the Samantha Power effect in the book. And the Samantha Power, I argue, or I, I say her thesis is essentially that the United States has been a bystander to genocide, uh, that it has not done enough to intervene in genocide, to prevent genocide. And Greg Grandin, who's written about the Guatemalan genocide and other uh, human rights issues in Latin America, puts the thesis as the problem is not what the United States does, but what it does not do, act to stop genocide. And what I will argue is that it actually goes much further than that, and I'll use the International Court of Justice uh, as a framework for that analysis. So I, I did want to make this at least somewhat interactive. Uh, can anyone tell me who coined the term genocide? I mean, there's some obvious parties who probably know the answer. Anyone? Sure. So that's the definition, right? Yeah. So Raphael Lemkin uh, coined the term in Axis, um, uh, Axis Power. I, I'm, I'm like freezing up a little. I can't even remember the title of the book. Um, but it came out in, I believe, 1943. Axis Rule and Occupied Thank you. <laughs> Axis Rule and Occupied Europe. Uh, he combined the um, genocide, meaning uh, to uh, murder a race or a tribe. Um, the legal definition was just given in part. Um, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent. So using, you know, maybe stuff from law school here, uh, genocide is a criminal term, or it has a criminal meaning, uh, and you have to have the actus reus and the mens rea, so you have to have the guilty act, uh, which are the pro prohibited acts, which I'll get to in a moment, but also the guilty mind. And the guilty mind for genocide, it cannot just be general intent. So you can deliberately kill people, um, but if you do so without the specific intent to destroy the group, then it's not genocide. So um, it more likely would be a crime against humanity or, or war crimes, depending on the circumstances. So uh, the prohibited acts include killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life, calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, uh, or imposing measures in, intended to prevent births within, within the group. So this is the legal definition. Um, and you can see here, you have national, ethnical, or ethnic, racial, or religious groups. And that is some of the cause of the criticism of the Genocide Convention. Two of the biggest deficiencies um, talked about in the Genocide Studies literature is the omission of political groups from the protected groups, although others argue that other social groups also should be included. Uh, and I would also then add to that the exclusion of cultural genocide, even though uh, cultural genocide is less accepted, uh, I would argue, in the genocide um, literature than the ad addition of political groups. And so one of the things that my previous research looked at was the evolution of the Genocide Convention. And so just like any other human rights treaty, the Genocide Convention did go through a period or a process of drafting and negotiations. 
And there are a few formal drafts that are accepted as formal drafts of the Genocide Convention. And the first was the Secretary Draft, which Raphael Lemkin contributed to. Uh, then there was an ad hoc committee was created, and they developed the ad hoc committee draft. You know, the Genocide Convention worked its way through the Sixth Committee and ultimately to the General Assembly, where it was adopted in December of 1948. Um, both political groups and, gen and cultural genocide were included in the first two drafts uh, before they were ultimately excluded from the final draft. And this was a very political process. So you have countries um, who made plausible arguments for why these elements should not have been included, um, but there may have also been selfish reasons for that as well. And so, you know, the Soviet Union generally is cited as responsible for the emission of political groups. It threatened to undermine the treaty. Uh, and there are reasons for that, right? So there's plausible reasons such as political groups, they argued, were not a permanent group. So you were not really born into political groups. It was something that you could move in and out of. Uh, the Soviet Union also argued, uh, you know, we could be accused of committing genocide when we're really just putting down an internal insurgency. And we need to have the right to protect the state. Um, but then there's also the fact that the Soviet Union was killing members of political groups, right? Uh, so there may have also been selfish reasons. The exclusion of cultural genocide was sort of the inverse of that, and it was the Western powers that were predominantly opposed to the inclusion of cultural genocide. Uh, the United States actually argued that it's more important that someone is able to express themselves freely than be able to express themselves using their own language. And so the United States, as well as uh, you know, the UK and France, argued essentially that cultural genocide did not meet or did not reach the level of, of extremity that physical genocide does. And we should not be equating burning of books and destroying uh, artifacts and other things with killing people. <coughs> and so the United States ultimately did a similar argument to the Soviet Union and said, you know, countries might just not support the Genocide Convention if it includes cultural genocide. And so ultimately both of these were excluded from the final text. So, in response to some of the deficiencies, uh, dozens of scholar, or there's been dozens of scholarly definitions. Most, most of them expand the group definition to include things like political groups, maybe other social groups. Um, at the same time, the Genocide Convention does prohibit uh, the creation of conditions that are, you know, that will create conditions that will not be uh, sustainable of life. But a lot of the genocide studies scholarly definitions exclude anything but direct physical genocide. Uh, and so they basically argue that it has to involve mass killings. In fact, it has to be mass murder. So it has to be a direct positive relationship, and it can't be something like negligence or uh, you know, uh, indirect genocide. Um, and then the majority also um, do maintain a strict specific intent requirement. So um, no matter what the policy is, no matter what's happening, the goal must be to destroy the group. Uh, <clears throat> recent trend, so uh, Alexander Hinton, who's at Rutgers University, um, has a piece he talks, that talks about critical genocide studies, and some of the criticism is on the cases that genocide scholars select, um, and the, um, you know, some of the limitations around comparative studies, uh, and there's also an increasing recognition of cultural genocide. And the increasing recognition of cultural genocide, as I'm sure many of you aware, does connect to the indigenous experience and recognition of the indigenous experience, whether it's in the United States, Australia, Canada, or elsewhere. Uh, what I refer to as pushing the envelope is getting into actually taking indirect genocide and going to something like structural genocide. Uh, and I'm, right now, I'm, I'm in the initial stages of a co-authored piece with uh, Nafiz Ahmed, who is based in the UK, uh, looking into famine and whether there's deliberate policy decisions that have impacts on sustainability um, and whether they, there's genocidal elements to those kinds of decisions. Of course, the intent requirement will be a big issue that we'll have to address in that as well. Um, indirect genocide. And one of the things I do argue in the book, um, something I, I do want to build on, is a nexus between war and genocide. I'm talking to Jess, I know that um, there's work here on humanitarian law. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what I, where I think there's a potential nexus between war and genocide. And since the book was published, I have expanded on uh, what I argue in the book uh, on a whole, an entire article that's focused on that. And so I can certainly talk about that as well later. <clears throat> so one of the things where, you know, Alexander Hill and I have, a, have, I think, a lot of similar interests in critical genocide studies. I don't think he would like my definition because he thinks simplicity is best. So uh, this is certainly is not a simple definition. Um, 
But my definition that I use in the book is genocide is the attempt to eliminate in whole or in part a national, political, social, ethnic, racial, cultural, or socioeconomic group. So really expanding the group definition <coughs> with the intent to destroy the group as such or for political, social, or economic objectives. So one of the things I argue in the book is that genocide can be a means to an end. And even though there may be some other objective, if the, if the intent is to destroy the group in, in part, in order to achieve that objective, that we should think about that in the, um, within the definition of genocide as well. Uh, membership in any of the aforementioned groups can be assigned um, by the members of the group or by those who are doing the killing. Um, so if the, those who are perpetrating the crime see you as a member of a group, then for all intents and purposes, you are, in fact, a member of a group. Um, then also methods of genocide include killing members, enacting policies that seek to erase the group's cultural identity, so also known as cultural genocide. And genocide may occur in times of peace or war, which is consistent with the convention, uh, with aggressive war sharing a nexus with the crime of genocide. Furthermore, both unarmed and armed, non-combatant and combatant members of the target group qualify. This is um, controversial as well. The vast majority of the genocide studies field believes that only the unarmed victims can be or the people who are unarmed members of group who are killed can be victims of genocide. And one of the things I argue in the book is this creates a fine line where things are act, in fact blurred. And because the definition of genocide is based on members of a group with the intent to destroy that group. So the fact that some may take up arms to resist their own self-destruction should not, I think, change uh, how we view the crime. Um, and so I ask these questions like, well, when does something that was genocide become a civil war? Uh, if something, if some take up arms, do they no longer become victims of genocide, but the unarmed people continue to be victims of genocide, or are they now victims of war crimes? And so it creates a situation where we're, I think, again, just putting a, a fine distinction where things are actually blurred. Um, and that you are denying those who take up arms their membership in the group, as well as the right to resist their own destruction. So, this in some ways connects to the redefining genocide as a nexus with the aggressive war. Um, so one of the things I, you know, some of you may be familiar with um, tradition, and the tradition in just war theory is that Yusef Bellum and Yusef Bello are considered as distinct. So the authority may decide to go to war, and it may be an unjust war, but those who are actually fighting the war still have a right to kill people on the other side. Um, and one of the arguments for doing so is, or you know, creating the separation is we want there still to be incentive for those fighting the war to obey humanitarian law. And if their actions were considered illegal or Ill illegitimate based on the unjust nature of the war, then there would be less incentive to obey the laws of the war because it's already illegitimate or unjust. So, um, and what I argue is that we can, you know, obeying the laws of war is something we would want in any armed conflict, right? It's supposed to minimize suffering both among the civilian population as well as those who are fighting the war. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make the acts legitimate. And um, if killing in war is illegitimate, then that opens space where genocide and war can have a, a relationship. Because if all killing in war, you know, again, that obeys international humanitarian law anyway, was considered legitimate, where all killings in genocide are illegitimate, then you could say, well, there's no space for a relationship there. But if the aggressor cannot legitimately kill um, people on the victimized side or the defensive side, then there is some space there. I do also, as I argued, you know, members who are armed should also be um, potential victims of genocide. And then one of the things I get at is, you know, depending on the circumstances of the war and what the objectives in the war are, that an argument could be made that members of the military are, in fact, members of a political group because they act as representatives of an institution that is, in fact, a political institution. Um, the military does serve political interests of the state or the authority, uh, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Uh, but this is a central piece to my argument that the United States committed genocide in Vietnam. Um, and so I'll come back to that. Okay. Everyone good so far? Any questions so far? Okay. So uh, in, in previous research, uh, so my dissertation research basically I looked at, I wanted to see how the international community, especially the permanent five members of the Security Council, responded to 20th century cases of genocide. Um, and this was a way to look at you know, the preventive language in the Genocide Convention, which I think was under-researched as you know, was compared to the criminal language. 
Um, and so I need to come up with a list of cases of genocide in which there's general agreement so that I could then look at those cases individually. And there is general consensus that the Armenian genocide, uh, the Holocaust, there is still you know, little disagreement on genocide in East Pakistan or present-day Bangladesh. Uh, the Cambodian genocide, still a little also because it depends on political groups and how you can include that in your definition. Uh, the Guatemalan, geno Guatemalan genocide, the Kurdish genocide in Iraq in 87, 88. Uh, the Rwandan genocide and Bosnia slash uh, Severinica, depending on whether you consider the entire conflict genocidal uh, or just the atrocities at Severinica. There was one scholar who only, after the Holocaust in Armenia, only looks at the Rwandan genocide. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with William Chavis. Uh, he wrote a book called Genocide and International Law. Um, but he takes a very, very strict and limited um, view of the legal definition of genocide, and so he only looks at Rwanda. So, coming back to Samantha Power a little bit here. So Samantha Power in her book includes Cambodia, Iraq, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Kosovo. I put Ronane in parentheses because uh, Peter Ronane is another author or scholar who has written specifically about the U.S. relation with genocide. And so these are the cases that generally fall into critique of the U.S. Uh, relationship with genocide. The commonalities in these selections, as I mentioned, is that with the exception of Iraq, the United States you know, was, had some influence, but did not have um, the kind of relationships with the, with the governments that committed genocide as they did in the cases that I include in my book, and I'll, I'll come back to that as well. So, the cases that I include uh, are cultural genocide uh, against indigenous populations in the United States, and this includes post-1948, uh, post-genocide convention, uh, Indonesia, and I say these are uncontroversial, um, for the indigenous one, it really depends if you recognize cultural genocide. If that's the case, then I would say that that's uncontroversial. If you believe political groups can be victimized by genocide, then it'd be Indonesia in 65 and 66 is um, uncontroversial. Uh, East Pakistan in 71, Guatemala in the early 80s, and Iraq in, in 87 and 88. Uh, controversial cases. So other cases I include are Vietnam uh, and the Iraqi the sanctions against Iraq in the 90s and early 2000s. So to give you the, the framework with which I used, um, you know, Bosnia versus Serbia was a case that was filed in 1993 by Bosnia against Serbia. And what Bosnia, or, you know, what Bosnia accused Serbia of was, was committing genocide in, in Bosnia. And the final ruling came in 2007. And what the International Court of Justice found in this case was that uh, Serbia did not have direct control over Bosnian Serbs. It did not directly commit genocide, so it did not had control over those who did commit it. Serbians themselves were not involved in the genocide. Uh, and they also found that Serbia did not conspire with the Bosnian Serbs to commit genocide or even shared complicity in the genocide. And what, what the ICJ did find, though, was that those who have close relations with the, those responsible for genocide also have a responsibility to prevent genocide. And that does not mean to intervene militarily. It means something as simply as using their influence to try and tell the, you know, those who are committing it, you know, you should not be doing this. And I'll, I'll touch more on that momentarily. So the convention's obligations. There is an obligation to prevent genocide. And so, you know, the, the ICJ was really interesting. Um, they really, they, they offered a, an opinion on something that would seems kind of obvious. And that is that because genocide is a violation of international law and because states have an obligation, obligation to prevent genocide in their own territories, that also extends extraterritorially. And so you cannot, you, you cannot aid or support or an, another state or group committing genocide. Um, and so that's the obligation to prevent, um, as well as the, you know, the response to prevent genocide, and it's a three-part test. Uh, let me come back to that in a moment. Um, so the Genocide Convention prohibits the commission of genocide. It, can, it prohibits conspiring to commit genocide, complicity in genocide, and inciting the commission of genocide. And I note that the conspiring to commit genocide is a two-part test. I mean, the commission of genocide, of course, is, is uh, one part thing, right? Like, you're either directly responsible or you're not. Um, but conspiring to commit genocide requires two things. It requires that you provide some sort of uh, material support, um, but also that you share the genocidal intent of the perpetrator. So if you do not share the genocidal intent, then you're talking about complicity. 
And so if you provide some sort of aid, and um, Mark Milanovic also argues that um, providing cover for genocide um, is, a, is also complicity, whether it's sort of diplomatic cover or some other form of um, obstruction. And then there's also inciting the commission of genocide, which you know, is beyond propaganda. There's a lot of debate in the negotiations around the Genocide Convention about what incitement is versus propaganda. And it has to have some sort of direct incitement to commit genocide. And I'll, I'll come back to that you know, more concretely in the Indonesia case. So in the book, I do argue that the United States was responsible for complicity in genocide in East Pakistan in 71, Guatemala in the early 80s, and Iraq in 87 and 88. Um, and I do this based on, on, a, on a few things, a few factors. And I don't want to go into too much direct de or too much detail on each individual case. I'd rather give you time you know, for Q&A. Um, but in the East Pakistan case, um, you know, the United States knew from March of 71, which is when Operation Searchlight began in Pakistan, uh, I guess maybe just quick background. Uh, Pakistan had just gone through some contentious elections in the 70s, uh, or I'm sorry, 1970. And the Awami League, which was based in East Pakistan, won the majority of seats in parliament. And in West Pakistan, they refused to seat the new government. And you know, this created calls for secession and other things coming out of East Pakistan. And in March of 71, um, the military was sent into East Pakistan, Operation Searchlight. And basically, uh, Bengali and Hindus were targeted. Um, and there was a, a, a council, Arthur Blood, who was in uh, Dhaka. And he wrote what, was what became known as the Blood Telegram. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. Um, but he accused Pakistan of committing genocide as early as early April 1971. And for the next eight to nine months, uh, the operations continued. And it didn't end until India intervened uh, late November, early December of 1971. Uh, the intervention, of course, was condemned for violating state sovereignty. Uh, and the focus was then on India versus Pakistan rather than what was happening uh, in East Pakistan. And so for all this time, you know, that there's you know, some information that the United States continued to provide the Pakistan, Pakistani military with weapons. Um, the United States also did obstruct, I would argue, at the Security Council, trying to redirect the conversation away from what was happening and towards the international conflict rather than what was happening in East Pakistan. And the United States actually sponsored a couple resolutions where they said, you know, all states need to go back to their own territory. But the problem with that would mean that India would leave East, East Pakistan and go back to India, but Pakistan could continue its military operations in East Pakistan because, of course, it was part of Pakistan. So going back to your own territories would mean that India would no longer be able to stand in the way of the genocide. And there was also a massive ref refugee issue. Ten million people left East Pakistan to, for India uh, who were then living in horrible conditions in India. Um, and so I argue that the United States, while it did not share the genocidal intent, did in fact continue to provide aid and support to Pakistan while the genocide was being committed over an eight to nine month period. Uh, similar arguments in, in Guatemala. Uh, the United States um, you know, supported Rio Osman and there were, you know, what something that would come up in Iraq too were dual use, te dual use technologies. And what the United States did was provide both Guatemala and Iraq with uh, technologies that could be argued to have a civilian purpose, but then could also be used for the military. Um, and that was one way to get around certain um, prohi prohibitions on uh, providing support for these countries. Um, I should say, you know, in East Pakistan, the numbers range from 250,000 people to a million. Um, tens of thousands of women were raped during these operations as well. Uh, Guatemala, the numbers, you know, range anywhere between 100 and 200,000 people, depending on who you cite, uh, primarily members of the Mayan community. Uh, who were targeted because of their support for the leftist uh, guerrillas, or even if they didn't support them. Um, so mines were 86% of the victims. Um, there were ways that the United States tried to blame um, the leftist guerrillas for the crimes that were being committed in Guatemala, again, as maybe a way to sort of misdirect. Um, but the, there's a, a, his, a historical commission, um, for historical clarification, excuse me, and it found that only 3% of the crimes were committed by the rebels, the rest were by the government. Um, and you know, Ronald Reagan had a certain affinity for Rios Mont. Uh, Rios Mont was known for saying, 
Um, we don't have a scorched earth campaign, we have a scorched communist campaign. And so making very clear who the, uh, the targets were. Uh, and then in Iraq, um, you know, the United States did support the Iraq and the Iraq-Iran war, uh, did provide chemical agents, uh, as well as all kinds of different financial aid through, uh, through agricultural credits and other things. Um, and was well aware, the intelligence the United States had in Iraq was well aware of um, the tensions between the Hussein government and the, uh, the Kurdish uh, rebels, but also Kurdish civilians. Uh, Iraq was known for using chemical weapons against the Iranian military, Iranian civilians, uh, armed Kurds, and then ultimately would use chemical, weapon against, chemical weapons against members of the Kurdish population uh, in 87 and 88. Uh, Iran actually wrote to the Security Council and accused Iraq of genocide, um, something that the United States um, really tried again to provide diplomatic cover for, not necessarily the genocide itself, but for Iraq's uh, policies. <coughs> uh, conspiracy to commit. So the Indonesia case is one that I tend to point out as um, one of the most egregious cases. Uh, so in 65 and 66, uh, as many as a million communists were, were killed in Indonesia. Uh, this was basically around October of 65 through April of 1966. Um, and the genocidal intent could not be more clear. The Indonesian government, or uh, the, the military under Saharto, it was very clear what they intended to do. Um, I won't go into too much of the, the background details, um, but declassified U.S. documents uh, make it very clear that the U.S. wanted to, if the Indonesian government was not willing to do so on its own, that it was willing to encourage them to destroy communism in Indonesia. And uh, Kathy Kadane, who was a journalist, did some interviews um, with former U.S. officials, and you know, it kind of came out that the U.S. provided lists of communists, uh, as many as 5,000 communists, um, gave it to members of the Indonesian military, and that list was used to hunt down and kill communists in Indonesia. Uh, an Indonesian government document um, has a number at a million, and that could be a conservative number. Uh, others do have it as lesser, you know, 500,000 to 600,000 people, and so. I mean, we're talking, if the number is a million, a million people over a seven month period or so who were killed just because they were communists. Um, and there were certainly other motiva motivations by the people who were on the ground killing, um, but that was essentially the intent behind the, the killing in Indonesia. Um, and the US did provide other, other means, but uh, that they were actually talking about in these declassified documents about um, encouraging the, the killing um, and that we needed to encourage, if they, don't, if they don't want to go all the way, we need to sort of encourage them to do so. Um, and finally, the actual commission of genocide. Uh, Indonesia, the indigenous cultural genocide is based around the boarding schools in the United States. Uh, or the, so, um, you know, Indonesia, indi sorry, indi indigenous youth were sent to these boarding schools. Um, you know, and anything that was sort of uh, part of their indigenous culture was tried to be, you know, sort of removed from them. Their hair was cut. They were given, um, you know, Anglo names. Uh, they were punished for carrying out cultural customs, uh, religion, speaking in their native tongue, etc. Um, cultural genocide is based around the, the concept is based around destroying a group while letting the people live. And so, a famous quote from um, one of the original directors of the board, of a boarding school based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, was kill the Indian, quote unquote, kill the Indian, save the man. Uh, and so rather than actually killing the people, um, we can actually destroy the group's identity by destroying their cultural existence, but allowing the people to survive. Uh, genocide in Vietnam, as I mentioned, you know, the nexus between aggressive war, I do argue that the United States, uh, in, its war in, genocide, in its war on Vietnam, um, it did intend to destroy communism as a viable political entity in Vietnam, and to do so, they had to kill uh, as many communists in Vietnam as possible. Uh, there were certainly other things about like, racism that was involved, and uh, there was a saying that a dead, Viet a dead, Vietnam a dead Vietnamese excuse me, is a dead Viet Cong, uh, and so equating all Vietnamese with the uh, communist factions. Um, and the goal ultimately was a uh, communist Korea Vietnam, and so there's different things there that connect there, whether you know, through the nexus between aggressive war and genocide, but also um, the political groups in, in Vietnam as well. And lastly, I do argue that the United States did commit genocide in Iraq with the sanctions. And this, maybe, I don't know which one would be the most controversial, um, but a, a primary response to my accusations with genocide in Iraq would be uh, questions about intent. 
um, that the United States did not intend to kill Iraqis as a national group. Uh, the intent was to re rein in the, the Hussein government. Um, but the issue here is the sanctions killed um, as many as 500,000 children in Iraq uh, from 1990 through 2003. So the sanctions were in response to Saddam Hussein's, um, you know, uh, what am I looking for? I'm looking here. Um, invasion of Kuwait, sorry, 1990. Uh, and the sanctions were carried through all the way until the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And the sanctions denied certain dual-use technologies again, so things that were needed to provide uh, clean drinking water, it affected hospital care. Uh, so children died from very preventable diseases and, and maladies, um, whether it was uh, cholera, typhoid, diarrhea-related disease, um, or not disease, but related um, issues. And these were all very preventable. And these, the, the, the deaths from these were not really found in Iraq until after the sanctions. Even when Iraq was in an eight-year war with Iran that was brutal, these maladies and these issues were not present. Um, things, you know, um, mortality increased significantly during the sanctions. Um, and the other issue is the Defense Intelligence Agency um, predicted the deaths. So in, um, I believe it was 1991, the Defense Intelligence Agency had a report that was published that said, um, you know, internally, that if they do not have access to all these things that provide potable drinking water, they basically said, this is what will happen. And then they enacted the sanctions anyway. Um, and they maintained those sanctions for um, more than 12 years. Um, Madeleine Albright has had this sort of fam famous interaction with Christine Shelley, who was a 60 Minutes reporter, uh, where Shelley said, you know, we hear that as many as 500,000 children have died in Iraq, you know, was it worth it? And Madeleine Albright says I, some, you know, something along the lines of, yes, I believe it was. Um, because of the outrage around that, she ultimately walked back that statement. Um, but the sanctions, you know, were, were justified by the U.S. Uh, to uh, change uh, Saddam Hussein's policies and weapons, et cetera. So. Um, Getting close to the end here, so we can you know, then have a, a discussion about this and answer any questions you have. Um, the absence of accountability. Um, what I argue in the book is that there's both legal impunity and immunity. Um, and the impunity comes from the United States does have a reservation to Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. And Article 9 is what gives the International Court of Justice uh, authority over disagreements about the application of the Genocide Convention, fulfillment of obligations, etc. And I would argue that the Article 9 reservations are, um, violate the spirit of the treaty and should be ruled to be like null and void. Um, but there has not been um, a case on that. In 1951, the International Court of Justice did come out and say that reservations to the Genocide Convention are acceptable as long as they do not violate the spirit and object of the treaty. Um, but actually, the, the, you know, rejecting the ICJ's <coughs> jurisdiction, I do think, impedes the um, application of the treaty. So there, there's an issue there. So the United States can basically say, um, all these cases that I go through, are, it's very hypothetical. If Guatemala were to go to the ICJ and say, we want to bring the United States before you for complicity in genocide, the ICJ would have to say, we don't have jurisdiction. And the ICJ actually established that. The Democratic Republic of Congo tried to bring Rwanda before the ICJ uh, in relation to genocide in DRC, or alleged genocide. And the ICJ said, we, we don't have jurisdiction because Rwanda has a reservation, so we can't actually rule on that. Um, and then, of course, you do have individual, I, I would argue, individual criminal immunity. So, of course, the United States is a non-party to the Rome Statute or signed and unsigned it. Um, as a permanent member of the Security Council, the United States can uh, veto any referral of any cases of US uh, nationals before the ICC. And finally, you know, the ICC can still gain jurisdiction if a United States national is on the territory of a state that is a party and there is a warrant for that individual or it has allegedly committed a crime on that territory. But the Bush administration created over 100 bilateral immunity agreements, so, um, which basically say that if uh, you know, Italy, we will not turn over a US citizen to the ICC, uh, and these agreements um, extend to over 100 countries. So, the United States essentially has practical immunity from accountability for any alleged violations of, of the Genocide Convention as well as other international law. 
So I believe this is it. Yeah, finally, the absence of accountability. So I do also argue that the United States has largely been omitted from genocide studies. Um, all three, and one of the things I, I argue is that, you know, there's definitely controversial cases, and I don't expect everyone to agree with what I argue. Um, but the complicity cases are not controversial. Uh, Guatemala, genocide in Guatemala is generally accepted. Genocide in Iraq is generally accepted, as well as in Bangladesh or East Pakistan. Uh, and yet these are oftentimes omitted, not from the large survey. So you have these large survey volumes that cover a lot of cases, and, and they're, they're typically included, although not necessarily the U.S. role. Um, but in analysis of the U.S., the U.S. is largely criticized for not intervening in Rwanda. That's kind of where a lot of the criticism comes from, as well as maybe Darfur. Uh, the conspiracy case, if you include political genocide, is not really controversial as well. Uh, the native genocide also, um, or cultural genocide, is not really controversial if you include it. Um, but yet there's this, again, this narrative <clears throat> that the United States is a bystander to genocide, but in fact it's actually um, had really close relationships with governments that have committed genocide as well as U.S. policies themselves. And so finally, uh, future research. So I'm looking into you know, further developing the nexus between aggressive war and genocide, uh, as I mentioned, in indirect genocide and structural genocide, but also means of accountability and recourse. And I do think that there's room for arguments to be made for why the International Court of Justice should rule that uh, reservations to Article 9 um, should not be able to, should not stand, they should not be recognized. Uh, and then, of course, there's been plenty of research on why the United States should and should not ratify the Rome Statute and what that would mean. So uh, I will end it there and um, open it up for discussion, Q&A, critiques, criticisms, etc. Thank you. Yes. Um, sounds really interesting. I um, I wanted to ask about uh, the Iraq case that you discussed because you mentioned like you know Congress really have the intent to do this, but I actually was just wondering like how would they have met the actus reus components of genocide or sanctions? Like what? Um, just because it seems like it's a bit more indirect than we would usually expect. It's not like they created a policy of denying these resources, it was sort of an indirect effect of some other policy that they had. Mm -hmm. um, so putting aside the intent issues, um, what, how do they meet the actus reus? Yeah. So that's where, it's interesting, right? Like I, I came up with my own definition because of my problems with the legal definition, but then I'm also like, but wait, we should also use these parts of the legal definition. Um, and so I would argue that it falls under um, Article 2C. Um, so Article 2 is the one that defines the crime of genocide. And because I would argue that, so well, let me do a couple things. So deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. Um, so if there, if there was going to be a case, I think it would have to fall under Article 2C. Um, and the other part of that is, you know, I believe it was the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. It may have been Yugoslavia, but I believe it was Rwanda that um, did say, you know, because direct intent is so hard to establish, right? Like other than the Nazis and, and other, you know, maybe other cases, those who are committing genocide do not come right out and say, like, we intend to destroy the group or we want to commit genocide. Um, and so they made a list of circumstantial evidence that sort of through a list of criteria, um, you could establish the intent to commit genocide or you can infer from the acts. And so, I do think that you can make the case that the U.S. did deliberately inf inflict these conditions um, because, again, that DIA report said, this is what will happen if we do this, and then they did it anyway. And I should say that the sanctions you know, were U.N. sanctions, uh, but there's general agreement among scholars, including legal scholars, that um, the sanctions were primarily at the behest of the United States, and that the United States also argued uh, to maintain them, and, and probably they would have been lifted maybe as soon as when Iraq was evicted from Kuwait in 1991. So, um, the intent issue, I, I don't know, do you think that, that it could fall under C minus the intent? Um, yeah, I think that makes, um, I think that makes some sense. I think the other part is like, you know, because I guess I actually could see almost fitting under C more so just because it's like, well, you know, the logic behind these, and I'm, I'm coming from a political science background, but also do international law, and 
like, you know, people debate about what is the point of sanctions, and Iraq is often pointed to like a case where the sanctions, you know, didn't work, because it's did, like what we wanted was for some to go away, and that's not what happened. Um, and so like, but the logic of the sanctions is supposed to be like, we're gonna make life so terrible for all of your people that you have to capitulate. So the, in that sense, they did know, and they were, like the whole point is to make life terrible for you know the citizens so in order to get their other objectives. So I think actually, as you were speaking, I was like, oh wait, this actually fits the logic of what the US is doing. You know, maybe they didn't want to eliminate Iraqi, like the Iraqi population, but they were, they were trying to make them Miserable and, right. to the middle, and to do a lot of harm. Yeah, and you know, the UNICEF and uh, the World Health Organization, others had done studies throughout the 90s where they were keeping track, and, yeah. and it came out to something like 7,000 children a month were dying, and, and that information was very public, um, and the sanctions were maintained. I mean, this this gets into also, you know, with the advent of, of the responsibility to protect. For those that are familiar, um, Gareth Evans uh, had, had a book that came out a few years after, and he was one of the co-chairs of the commission that developed R2P. Um, and this is where like, the rise of targeted sanctions, right? Because sanctions were so criticized because of how badly they affect the populations. But then it was like, well, sanctions aren't bad. It was just the way these were implemented. And if we actually just target certain people, but oftentimes it still sort of trickles down to the population. Um, so, yeah. Tons of questions about this. this is amazing. Thank you. Um, the first question is, in general, like, what are the actual remedies that, that you envision? Do you think that anything can actually be done? Is there some way to um, get a remedy out of any of this? I, it seems like some of these cases have a lot of proof. Number one. Uh, number two. I'm interested in the uh, indigenous American part um, because. I question that. I just wonder if any actual indigenous Americans have pushed back on this since people were actually massacred in America, and there might be more proof of that than of talking about schools. I mean, I'm not saying that the school issue isn't important, and cultural genocide obviously has impact, but you could argue that that opens floodgates, right? Because most of the great nations you know, uh, participated in colonization, and the essence of colonization is almost word for word your definition of cultural genocide. <clears throat> it's taking away someone's national identity and converting them into British or converting them into whatever else. So how do you distinguish the two? Sure. Um, I know this is my my book talk, um, but Ben here, I know <laughs> you want to introduce yourself? I don't know if the students will know. Sure. You. I don't, I'm not from this school, I'm from over there, from the History Department and American Indian Studies. Um, but I'm, I'm also a genocide scholar. And here's this book, An American Genocide, um, which actually I think chronicles you know, what you're asking there. Um, so, I, I mean, I focused on 48 Forward, and that's why the cultural genocide issue was primarily. Um, I do talk just a little bit as a sort of introduction about physical genocide uh, during settler, settler colonialism. Um, you know, Leo Cooper, who's a, a scholar who was one of the first um, sort of comparative genocide scholars, he wrote in 81 or 82 a book called uh, The Political Use of Genocide in the 20th Century or some, something like that. And one of the things he does talk about is colonization and decolonization, right? So it's not simply settler colonialism, say, in, in Australia, Canada, and the United States. But he argues that there are genocidal elements of just simply the act of colonization. And that one of the things that separates cultural genocide from the physical genocide is how the people were needed to be used by the colonizers for economic purposes. And in a lot of ways, he's talking a lot about Africa. And, and he talks about Algeria uh, significantly. And then how the process of decolonization had some genocidal elements as well, because the, co the colonial powers, you know, France in this, in this case, uh, attempt to hold on to the colony. Um, through great violence among, on the people. So um, I, I did want to note that um, the, you know, the remedies is a complicated thing. And, and I don't want to say that you know, what I'm doing here is, is, is pointless, um, because I, I don't see remedies. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I don't yeah. see the United States being held accountable, yeah. um, whether it's for complicity or commission of genocide. Um, you know, there's a, another book that's called, sorry, 
And I had this being recorded, which is a book called The Benevolent Experiment, and it's about uh, boarding schools in Canada. This, these are my reading lists right now. Um, and there's a, the last chapter is on, on reparations. Um, and Wolford does talk about the complications around this and, and trying to figure out why there's more movement in Canada for accountability or some form of reparations than there is in the United States. And what's, what about the indigenous experience in the United States is different. Uh, and he actually finds a lot of similarities. Um, and he does raise questions, well, you know, the United States is a litigious society, so why aren't we seeing more lawsuits um, or more attempts at, at reparations or, or restitution? Uh, and so I don't really know the answer to that. And um, I mean, but you also see the United States has yet to come to terms with the history of slavery and other things. And so, um, I mean, sorry to interrupt, yeah, yeah, but sure. <clears throat> like, I'm just glancing at your slide, and like, literally, it says um, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and African Americans were forcibly sterilized. Right. Um, so that already qualifies. I'm. I just feel like um, it's almost futile because the amount of money and resources that would have to be transferred to actually remedy those harms is just impossible um, within the American context, North American context. But if you look at the broader view, there's also the entire hemisphere because the Spanish engaged in the same thing, right? We're talking about colonization. And the British did it you know, in the Caribbean and the French did it in the Caribbean. So that's just a huge number of people who would then be able to make that claim. So I just don't see like, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's pointless, I think it's great. I just think if you're gonna do it, why not open it up and talk about the bigger picture then? I'm just wondering. Yeah. Well, so just plug my book that's not a book yet uh, on cultural genocide, and it, it's actually an edited volume, and there's scholars who are writing about uh, cultural genocide in all the hemisphere contexts. So, um, you know, the, we are looking at it as a, as a broader global issue. Um, you know, going back to the, the remedies thing, um, you know, as I said, I don't really see much movement there, but I do think we have to begin by changing how we talk about these things. And if we don't acknowledge that these things are happening or have happened, um, then I don't think we can make the progress towards some form of remedy. Um, you know, the United States is still, um, as I said, sort of largely omitted from genocide studies, uh, at least in terms of its own responsibility, um, as well as, you know, previous historic crimes that preceded the Genocide Convention. Um, and I do think scholars have a responsibility to um, try and create the space where we do talk about these things in a more open and honest way, uh, at least my truth, I guess. Um, and before we can do, you know, before we do that, um, I just don't see where the space is for us to have these conversations. And of course, that also means that scholars have to, you know, step out of the ivory tower, right? Like, if the only people who are reading this book are um, other academics or students, and you know, maybe this isn't, isn't getting into the public discourse, then I'm also then not achieving what I'm hoping to. And um, I mean, I don't know if anyone's actually interested in the book, but Rutledge is also not helping because the book is $140. Uh, so I don't know who's buying the book um, other than those who are adopting it for, for class use. Um, but I'm hoping that it does get out in paperback at some point so that it's actually affordable uh, and uh, you know, people will hopefully read it. Yeah. I, I just want to answer your question. I think there are legal remedies available, and there is the possibility for reparations and the transfer of land and resources and money. But like Jeff said, it's the acknowledgement and then the public apology that is crucial. So we think about the landmark reparations issue, which is Germany and the Holocaust. It took the mayor of Berlin, Willy Brandt, going to Warsaw and doing the famous knee fall that he knelt on his knees apologized on behalf of German people. That changed the public consciousness dramatically. So in Canada and Australia, where these things are a very different place in progress than they are in the United States, it took public protests, public acknowledgments, and public apologies by large numbers of students like yourselves, but also by political leaders and academics at the time that changed the tenor of the conversation and opened the door for consideration of, for example, the Freedom of Reconciliation Commission related to the stolen generations and the 60s scoop in Canada. And that made that part of the public discourse, part of public education, allowed for memorialization and commemoration in museums and in the educational sphere, and for statements by major political leaders in Canada 
that the stolen generations in the 60s, this cultural genocide equivalent in Canada, did in fact meet the UN Genocide Convention's definition of genocide, and therefore warranted not only apology, but monetary reparations. So we, you know, in California, we just had something major happen, which was that the governor acknowledged that what happened in California was, in his words, an actual genocide. And so that's a step, but we can't stand outside of it. We're part of the solution. It's up to us to write letters, to write signs and protest and mobilize. It's not going to happen on its own volition. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just a quick thing, you know, adding to the, the culture. I mean, you also think about the, sort of the resistance to this. I mean, Henry Kissinger was involved in, in foreign policy through a number of these cases, from you know, Vietnam to Indonesia, um, and he's an elder statesman now. You know, so this person is the like, people, politicians who want to be president, want to be seen, or at least don't reject being seen with him. Um, and so that, I mean, we're not having those conversations. I mean, it was, it was kind of controversial when Bernie Sanders um, talked about, you know, Latin America and U.S. foreign policy um, in Argentina and Chile and et cetera. Um, so, I, I mean, I, get, I guess ultimately what I'm saying is it comes back to creating this space where in the mainstream, like, you know, those who come out and say things, I think, like I'm saying, are, are pushed to the margins, you know, in, in the public discourse or the popular political discourse. Um, and I think we need to have that space where we can have these kinds of conversations and not brand me as some sort of, like, radical or something um, for holding these kind of critical ideas about U.S. foreign policy. And, you know, and some of this comes back to those first two slides, you know. The, the critique was, like, I'm criticizing Samantha Power, who's being held up, you know, on, at a certain um, level. And, and a lot of attack was based on that criticism of how Samantha Power portrayed it. You know, in some of the writings of Samantha Power, she basically says the United States um, did not protest about what was happening in Pakistan. It was so much more than that. And she refers to U.S. support for Iraq and, and as, you know, the Reagan administration punted on genocide. And it's like, that's, that's just, in, you know, it's not that her analysis uh, and the depth that she goes into is insufficient. It's the critique of U.S. foreign policy that is sort of based around this, you know, kind of status quo that when we move outside of that, I think that, you know, you get, you get sort of pushed to the side. And I think we need to have more open debate about these things. So, uh, sorry, that may have been a little bit of a, a rant there. But uh, I know, Jess, you had a hand, and I know there was a hand. There's a student there yeah. that wants to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a very interesting solution. I would like to uh, learn about uh, your opinion about if we can uh, accept very extensive uh, definition of genocide. How can we di uh, differentiate crimes uh, against humanity, war crimes, or genocide? Because all of them are different crimes according to ICC statutes. You know. For example, you mentioned about rank Iraq sanctions. How can we di differentiate? Well, I mean, I suppose the the easy answer would be to, to point to specific intent. Um, yeah. So we, right, legally, specific intent is going to be the, the factor that differentiates. So um, a, a crime against humanity, so actually one thing I was going to plug for you guys that are interested, uh, Joy Gordon has an article on um, it, you know, why intent is important or something. It's about these sanctions in Iraq, and she basically has a counter to... Uh, although she wrote it first, uh, to, to my position on Iraq. And she makes the argument that, or she uses an example of the Jewish people, and she says, you know, if the intent was anything but the destruction of the Jewish people simply because they were Jewish, then we're not talking about it's genocide. Easy, but the other right. examples are not so easy. Right. Yeah. Right. So the, you know, the specific intent, um, there's other scholars who would certainly disagree with my argument about war because they would say, you know, there's terrible things that are done in war, and people are killed, including civilians, um, but if it's not the intent to commit genocide, then we're talking about war crimes and not genocide. And so I think an illegal interpretation, a very strict interpretation of the specific intent requirement would be that, well, you can kill, it could be all members of a specific group. Um, it could be any of those prohibited acts, but if the intent is economic gain or political gain or to remove people from land, then you're maybe talking about ethnic cleansing or, or a crime against humanity. Um, it has to be, you're killing these individuals because you want to destroy the group as such. Um, so that's, I mean, I don't want to give you like, the easy answer, 
Um, and I, I would argue, of course, that these lines are actually more blurred than that. Um, and how we think about these crimes, I think, is in some ways are influenced by, I mean, first of all, like war. War is considered as a legitimate act in international affairs, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's condemned, it's uh, prohibited unless it's, you know, under Article 51 of this, the Charter, so it, unless it's self-defense or the Security Council has authorized it. But more and more, I mean, wars aren't really fought that way, right? Like, the invasion of Iraq was based on, I mean, any number of reasons that were given uh, in 2003, like it was to prevent like a mushroom cloud, you know, um, or, you know, Iraq was a serial violator of UN resolutions and therefore we were actually authorized by the fact that they were not obeying international law. Um, and I go by a, a pretty strict interpretation of the war of, of war of aggression, which is something that is not in response to an imminent attack or a direct attack, or it's not um, under Security Council authorization. But that gets complicated too, because then you're getting into, you know, when can wars be fought for the purpose of defending human rights? I mean, if it's not, you know, Kosovo, I would argue by the definition I used was an, a war of aggression, um, because it was not authorized, at least not to, you know, ex until after the fact. Um, and no states would ever, I mean, According to states who have launched wars of aggression, there's never been a war of aggression in history, right? Like no state admits to <laughs> attacking another state unprovoked or unauthorized or without some sort of you know justification. Um, and then if you're talking, you know, then all war is legitimate if every war is fought in you know, quote unquote self-defense. And so I, I do think that war. Um, I, there's a I, I feel like I'm sort of rambling here, but there's a, a scholar uh, Irving Horowitz who had a, he wrote that, you know, war is fought by democracies and authoritarian governments alike, but genocide is the handmaiden of the authoritarian state. And I really feel like that fits into this idea that liberal states or democracies do not commit genocide, only authoritarian states do, and but because dem democracies and authoritarian states both fight wars, that therefore war is legitimate because democracies also do it. Um, and I do think it, it you know, creates this, this distinction where you know, I do think we need to think about how we can compare uh, genocide, war, and, and crimes against humanity to see where these, there, there's overlap, you know, where in the Venn diagram there's that shared element. Um, and that's where I think there is room to test um, the validity of a very strict specific intent requirement. I hope that <laughs> was a long-winded answer to your question. Uh, um, so if I can just add something on to that very briefly first. Another thing to keep in mind is when you look at what international courts and tribunals do, they will often charge the same uh, crime bases and the same instances under a variety of different charges, right? So you can have the same actions charged as both genocide, war crimes, and even crimes against humanity. So there is a significant amount of overlap, but in order to reach that level of genocide, which is sometimes talked about as being at sort of the top of the hierarchy of international crimes, if you want to think about it in that way, it is requiring that very, very specific intent of destruction yeah. of the group. But it can also be other things, so just, yeah. just to keep that in mind. Um, which, which is also interesting because the, uh, you know, the Nuremberg Tribunal said that war, of the wars of aggression are actually the supreme crime from which all other crimes you yeah. know, grow out of. Um, but genocide has certainly overtaken that top yeah. in the yeah. hierarchy. Crimes of crime. Yeah. Right, the crime of crimes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of my question, I guess it's more of a comment, or I just want to hear more about it. I think this is super fascinating, and I completely agree with the need for an expansion of the types of groups we're thinking about. But I was really interested to hear this idea that you mentioned very briefly about the idea of members of the military as members of a political group. Mm -hmm. Because when we're talking about expanding uh, the types of groups, presumably, um, we don't just want to be thinking about this in a theoretical way, and we want to be thinking about this as practically what will states accept within this expansion. And it seems to me that including that military category as a political group would immediately mm -hmm. cause states to sort of turn away from it and refuse to accept it. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, <laughs> it is um, very much a conceptual um, or theoretical argument. Um, it was, which was interesting about coming to uh, the law school today because you know I did want to focus on the evolution of the Genocide Convention, at least a little bit, um, and so, so getting into the evolution of, of law, um, as well as the, the ICJ, but then I also knew I was going to be presenting to at least some members of an audience who are um, law students, 
that I'm actually using a definition that is not recognized under the law. So, um, and where how that would sort of fit with you guys or some of you guys. So, um, I mean, the the members of the, the inclusion of members of the military certainly would be a non-starter. I mean, we're talking about uh, more cultural genocide in a lot of cases is, is a non-starter. Um, you know, the United States did during the negotiations actually emphasize this point that armed conflict, you know, genocide armed conflict must be considered as distinct. Uh, again, based on, on intent. Um, and the United States did uh, uh, reiterate this during the Korean War as well, um, when you know, something like 20% of the Korean population uh, was, was killed, uh, up to 3 million people or so. Um, and again, so there's this, this focus that we want to make sure that when we are fighting wars, we're not going to be also accused of, of committing genocide. Uh, the inclusion of members of the military then, you know, certainly is, is not something that I foresee being um, codified in any way or part of customary law either. Um, but it did grow out of this recognition that, or my argument I suppose, or proposal that armed members of the group should not be excluded from victims of genocide. Um, and you know, in the genocide studies literature, there really is an overwhelming emphasis on the defenselessness of the victims and, and that they are civilians and, and they are quote unquote innocent. Um, and innocence, meaning uh, I-N-N-O-C-E-N-T-S, we are generally referred to non-combatants. So once you actually pick up arms, you're no longer an innocent, you are now a participant uh, in the armed conflict. Um, and so you know, it does not fit into, into the definition of genocide. But I, I take a sort of, Jeff McMahon has written a lot about this, about the, um, you know, uh, you said Bellman and, and you said Bellow, uh, and argues that you don't lose your innocence simply by being a member of the military if you are attacked without provocation. Um, and so it is sort of a multi-step process to get to the point where members of the military would be considered members of a political group. Um, and I do think that um, I will see, receive a lot of pushback on that. Um, I guess we'll see you know, I, on that article that I submitted how, how they respond to it. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't think that we should accept that, and not saying that you are accepting that, but that members of the military can justly be killed simply be, by being members of the military. Um, and that wars of aggression do share this nexus of, with genocide because we're talking about Ill illegitimately killing. Um, and then, of course, then there's also this stretch, perhaps, um, where members of the military do serve a political purpose. And one of the arguments I make is that even if the members of the military do not share the political um, ideology of the group in power, um, you know, not every member of the military right now supports Trump, just like not every member of the military before maybe supported Obama. Um, but when they are attacked, they are viewed by the aggressor as representatives of the state, regardless of what their political orientation is. And so they become de facto um, members of a political group in the eyes of the aggressor. Uh, and so that's where I, how I, I get to that. Um, but you're right. I, I mean, in terms of legal uh, protection, I don't see that. Did that answer? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So we'll work our way backwards. <laughs> So moving forward from here, what would you say is the ideal way for the U.S. to then intervene in a genocide? In a genocide. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, depending on the situation, um, I mean, ideally we just we would stop intervening, uh, and by that I mean um, stop providing arms, uh, stop providing political support. Uh, I think that has to be the first step, um, and that of course does involve. Um, situations where the United States does have a direct relationship with the genocidal government. Um, in the cases I prevented, presented, of course, that, that I think that was the case. Um, you know, the next step, you know, I mean, I, I suppose one other step would be at the Security Council. Um, there have been times when the United States has, I mean, Rwanda would be an example where the United States has, um, I think, played a major role in obstructing um, response to genocide. And, you know, I, th I think. Too often, cases of genocide remain unrecognized until it gets to such a point that serious intervention becomes an only option um, or um, a main option. So if you think, think about the case of Rwanda, you know, Romeo Dallaire had come up with a, an approach that would have involved um, creating like, safe areas uh, at soccer or football stadiums, which would have required minimal intervention. Uh, there's a Japanese scholar who I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, um, but he talked about um, carving out these um, 
safe havens. And so the intervention would not be offensive where you're actually at attacking people who are committing genocide, uh, which is a very complicated thing. There's a, a number of books on um, the killers in Rwanda and how they became capable of, of carrying out those acts. And when people commit genocide, I, there's another book called Becoming Evil, and it's about how people become, again, capable of committing mass atrocities. It's a more complex thing than just like, oh, I'm just going to go out and kill people. Um, and so defensive approaches, I think, is, is an important thing, um, where you're not actually going out to kill those who are committing genocide, but it's actually to protect the people who are at risk. Um, and so if there's ways to do that, I think that's a, a, a good approach. Um, yeah, so, trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to like, uh, like lose my steam here. <laughs> so, okay. uh, so I mean, I think those, those are important ways. I mean, there are ways that sanctions, I think, can be used um, effectively in minimal ways that, you know, don't harm the population. Um, but I do think humanitarian approach is, is also still the best approach. So uh, if you think about the intervention in Libya, um, I mean, maybe um, Gaddafi was, was full of it and had no intentions of, of um, ceasefires and, and allowing for safe corridors. Um, but Gaddafi did um, propose a number of ceasefires um, with the Libyan rebels and NATO. Uh, the African Union proposed safe corridors to Egypt from Libya. And these, these proposals were rejected. And I feel like where I believe that if you're really committed to the most humanitarian um, outcome, then you have to at least take these options seriously rather than saying, all right, we're going to use military force, we're going to launch bombs from the air, and that's how we're going to intervene to protect people. Um, so I do think there are other means that are different than military intervention. And I don't, know, I don't want to assume from your question that you know, military intervention was what you were thinking, but oftentimes I think military force becomes the default um, rather than the last resort. We have time for one more okay. question. Um, you had mentioned that uh, many countries, when it comes to expanding the definition to include cultural genocide, uh, many countries that are large um, are involved in this sort of thing. And it's not just former colonial powers, but even in areas, for example, um, where the Swahili is the only <coughs> language of uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and even though not officially in Rwanda, there's plenty of Rwandans that speak Swahili as well. Um, all of these people spoke individual languages at one point, and a trickle of them still do, um, and had individual you know, uh, types of dressing and expressing themselves. Um, and that's the case across the all of North Africa, which uses um, Arabic as a blanket language. Um, the people of Morocco and Algeria and Libya, and so they all had their own individual cultures and languages. It wasn't a blanket Arabic. And even when people took on Arabic originally before there was television, um, to to make people able to easily understand each other. In the, in the prior decades, a Moroccan would barely be able to understand a Yemeni what, if people were speaking street Arabic, let alone true languages and dialects. That's, that's also the case throughout Latin America, and even though you're disturbed by the killings in Indonesia, as one should be, which are, to me, massacres, not genocide, uh, and massacres are quite bad enough in and of themselves. Uh, Indonesia is also, it's from Sumatra to, to Irian Jaya is the distance between, you know, like Seattle to, to Miami. And there were different languages and cultures throughout that entire area, which has now an umbrella language for the purpose of trade and schooling and education, uh, Bahasa Indonesia. But all of those people spoke very different languages. It's not like somebody in Sulawesi was originally able to understand somebody, you know, from Malacca. Um, these are every large area now has umbrella languages for the purposes of trade and education. Um, 
I mean, yeah, the lingua franca. I mean, well, lingua franca, you know, so for business purposes, um, you know, adopting certain languages. I mean, one of the things I can't comment specifically on um, on everything you said, but I mean, it does make me think of uh, Damien Short has a piece. He's a, he's a sociologist on um, cultural genocide that he talks about assimilation versus uh, or diffusion versus forced assimilation. Um, and how cultures can adapt to changing environments and circumstances by adopting um, certain elements of the, you know, maybe the more dominant culture uh, versus being forced to accept and change the culture to fit the dominant culture. Um, and I don't think that's the case in all, in all the cases that you were uh, bringing up, but I, I definitely am interested in looking more into, you know, what I, I guess what I would say is cultural imperialism uh, versus cultural adaptation and, and how we can distinguish between those two things historically. I believe me, it was forced. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nobody took those things on because they felt on it. Thank you very much. Thank Jeff. you.